Thank you, Norma. It's so nice just sitting out here in the cool morning, having my cup of coffee, listening to Norma play. So it's a great way to do it. Good morning, everybody. Let's begin our service by joining and singing, He Has Made Me Glad. And uh, um, the words are in your bulletin, if you don't remember, but we'll sing out loud. So I'm going to have you stand up, all of you who just got settled well in your chairs out here in the yard. Join us, uh, stand up. If, 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 if able. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Well, we did that well enough. I think we should do it again. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Be seated. We've been waiting for this, and it seems like it's taken a long time because it's practically August, but we're finally having an outdoor service, and we have a beautiful morning for it. For those of you who are joining us online, we're out in the backyard of our church and uh, and just just delighted to be out here. So this morning, we're going to be jumping back into our study of Acts. And uh, we're looking at a question about, well, when people feel out of control, we've all been in that place, how we feel powerless, we become hungry for someone or something that promises to return us to some level of control. And there are times these days where it feels as though the whole world is out of control whether it's conflict happening in our own hometown or division happening in our denomination or turmoil in national politics, violence around the world, even if we can't any longer ignore the changing climate that may be changing our lives, a lot of times we feel that we have no say about how things are going. And you know, I think that's why there's why superhero movies are so popular. Because we'd kind of like a superhero to come and fix things. But as we're going to talk today, Jesus offers something a little bit better. So that's, that's uh, we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes. Those of you who've joined us online, just in case you don't know, this is the United Methodist Church of Osceola, Wisconsin. And it is the 30th of July that is our service this morning. And we welcome, we're glad to have you online, as well as everyone who's with us in person. Uh, but let's join together. Those of you who are here in your bulletins, uh, join me and let's, let's um, say our call to worship. Mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and grace. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. As we gather today in your name, we pray that you would fill our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Transform us, Lord. Make us more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to join in singing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. It's, we were hearing Norma play it for the prelude. We're going to join and add our own voices to that. You can stay seated as you sing, but join us for Come Christians, Join to Sing.
Sometimes up in front here, it's harder to hear everybody out in the yard singing because I bellow out really loud. I heard you guys. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just thinking of, of words of praise um, that are like a, a psalm as we sing, Come again. And shout out, sing out, Alleluia. Amen. Loud praise to our God. Uh, I'm going to look into the text. We're going to read from the book of Acts in chapter 17. Let's pray quick about, uh, that sounds like I really need prayer before I read this. I probably do. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we look into your word, open our hearts and our minds and uh, guide us as, as we look in uh, to the message you have for us today. Amen. Acts chapter 17, the first 15 verses, um, I'm reading from the Common English Bible, that version of Scripture. Paul and Silas, they journeyed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and then came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As it was Paul's custom, he entered the synagogue, and for three Sabbaths, he interacted with them on the basis of the scriptures. Through his interpretation of the scriptures, he demonstrated that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. He declared, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. The Hebrew language that, word that he might have used was not Christ, but the Messiah. Some were convinced and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of Greek God worshipers and quite a few prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and they brought along some thugs who were hanging out in the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They attacked Jason's house, intending to bring Paul and Silas before the people. When they didn't find them there, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city officials. And they were shouting, these people who have been disrupting the place throughout the empire have also come here. And what's more, Jason has welcomed them into his home. Every one of them does what is contrary to Caesar's decrees by naming someone else as king, Jesus. Now this provoked the crowd and the city officials even more. And after Jason and the others had posted bail, they released them. As soon as it was dark, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas on to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. 
The Berean Jews were more honorable than those in Thessalonica. This was evidence in the great eagerness with which they accepted the word and examined the scriptures each day to see whether Paul and Silas' teaching was true. Many came to believe, including a number of reputable Greek women and many Greek men. But the Jews from Thessalonica learned that Paul also proclaimed God's word in Berea. So they went there too and were upsetting and disturbing the crowds. The brothers and sisters sent Paul away to the seacoast at once, but Silas and Timothy remained there in Berea. Those who escorted Paul led him as far as Athens and then returned with instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible. May God bless the hearing and the understanding of this portion of Scripture. Riot. Now, we remember a few years ago how George Floyd was killed by a police officer while other officers kept onlookers from intervening. And after a, a video of Mr. Floyd's arrest and murder began to spread, protests erupted in Minneapolis and in many other cities. Between the anger of the protesters and often an often overreactive response on the part of the police, these protests quickly turned into riots. A couple of years ago, that was May 26th, that all started in 2020. In Minneapolis, at least, the violence continued for five days. It resulted in at least two deaths, over 600 arrests, over a thousand properties in the Twin Cities were damaged, some totally destroyed. And the cost was figured to be over 400 million. Now there were many other protests and a few other riots. We, we don't get a lot of riots in Osceola. Um, and so that seems a little bit strange we have a hard time understanding them sometime, even when they're as close to us as, as the Twin Cities. Uh, but, they, but they seem to occur for all kinds of different reasons. His, historically, sociologists, sociologists that riots occur due to poverty, due to unemployment, poor living conditions, government taxation or oppression, conflicts between ethnic or religious groups or frustration with legal channels for airing grievances. Those are, that's sort of a technical Wikipedia definition of, of what, a, what causes a riot. Except, riots also happen sometimes when your team wins a game. When the Eagles won the Super Bowl for the first time in 2018, rioting broke out in Philadelphia. Detroit rioted when the Tigers won the World Series in 1984, and again when the Pistons won the 1990 basketball championships. And in Chicago, for three years in a row, 91, 92, and 93, when the Bulls won the championship, yep, more riots in Chicago. But there have been riots in every country around the world throughout history. Egypt, Germany, France, Hong Kong, South Africa, Argentina, Chile. In LA, we heard about some of those, many of us, those were the first riots we heard about in 65 or in 94, in Chicago in 68 at the Democratic Convention, in New York in 1969, the Stonewall riots, um, in Thessalonica, in A.D. 45. That's approximately when Paul was there. Riots. It isn't the first time we've run into a riot here in the book of Acts, and it won't be the last time either. There seems to be a recurring theme in this book of people rioting. Now, there are other bits of the story that we'll see again, and it seems like a bit of a repetitive theme. Paul comes into a situation, Paul speaks in a certain way, often at the synagogue, and that seems to cause a riot. Now, celebrating a World Series win and reacting to what happens to George Floyd are two very different things. And then responding to someone's preaching seems different yet. Yeah. Um, that's all Paul is doing, preaching there. And, and I really encourage you that if there's anything in the sermon that you're not happy with, please resist going over to the parking lot, overturning a car and setting it on fire. Um, that just 
let's, that, that'll just be our agreement today. So people say there, there seems to be a collective release point that happens with the riot. It happens when people band together, but why? What is it that moves it? Well, there's a guy, Tori Higgins. He's a professor from Columbia University, a researcher in social psychology as well as in the science of motivation. Essentially, he studies the question of what it takes, what motivates people to do what they do. And in his study on the psychology of a rioter, he writes that riots such as these occur when people feel ineffective. In situations where there's been a long period before the riot of feeling as though they're not in control of their own life. It may be something financial like unemployment, a low paying job, political, he says. It may be something like COVID. It may be something like being closed in for a long time. Um, he says basically, People don't feel respected or that they're making a difference in the world. And so rioters band together around these feelings of powerlessness. And if you're feeling that you're not in control of your life, you might want to band with others who are feeling the same way. And then with those others, you regain a sense of power. So that becomes a fitting question in this text because of the riots that broke out in Thessalonica after Paul preached. So why on this particular time? What was it that Paul had done just preaching sermons? For three weeks, he was simply preaching in the synagogue. Now, that's not really riot worthy. A lot of people were doing that. That's what Jewish teachers did. He was preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, and because of that, he had to suffer and die and rise. And all of that, all of that preaching was actually part of a long tradition of prophecies about the Messiah. I mean, people knew stories about the Messiah, including the prophecies about his suffering. It was part of the story. It was part of the tradition, and Paul was simply reminding them of it. You know that this is part of the pattern of the Messiah. It's been in the prophets. It's been part of our tradition. It's, he's also arguing that Jesus did that, that he fit the pattern, and that's necessarily part of Paul's message. But this was not news to the Jewish community. I mean, it fits with their understanding. You don't really riot over that. In fact, it's at the synagogue. That's where, that's where these things come up. The synagogue is where you talk about it, where you argue about it, where you dispute all of the issues that you find in the holy books. And sometimes people come up with crazy ideas and you argue with them about it. I mean, that's what the synagogue is for. You don't go starting a riot. But what about that sense of powerlessness? What is it that, in, that brings that into the people? Where does this loss of control come in your own life? And to look into that a little bit, I'm going to take a little bit of a trip back into the Gospels, into the Gospel of Matthew in particular, chapter 16. And it's an encounter between Jesus and one of his lead disciples, Peter. Now, when Jesus came into the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And Jesus said, yeah, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human being has shown this to you. Rather, my Father who is in heaven has shown you. I tell you that you are Peter, and I'll build my, rock, I'll build my church on this rock, and the gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then he ordered the disciples not to tell anybody that he was the Christ, the Messiah. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem, to have to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, 
and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. And then Peter took hold of him and began scolding Jesus and said, God forbid, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stone that could make me stumble, for you're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. And then Jesus said to his disciples, everyone who wants to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And all who want to save their lives will lose, will, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. So, it's a confusing afternoon for Peter. Okay, Peter, how was your day? Well, I'm getting kind of mixed messages from Jesus. I, I don't know if I'm the rock on which the church is built or if I'm Satan. <laughs> And, and, and Paul's in the synagogue years later with that same message that Jesus is the Messiah and must suffer and die. It's the same story. Jesus says, who am I? Peter says, you're the Messiah. Jesus says, right. And that means that I'm going to have to walk this path of suffering and death, death and resurrection. That's what it means to be the Messiah. And Peter goes, hey, hey, Jesus, take it easy with all this dying and stuff. I mean, you know going a little overboard there, a little extreme. And Jesus says, Peter, get out of the way. Don't become an obstacle to God's work. Actually, the literal meaning of Satan in Scripture is adversary, the one who opposes us in the accomplishment of our designs. And Peter's saying, don't oppose me. Je Jesus is saying to Peter, don't oppose me in the accomplishment of my design. Don't become a stumbling stone, an obstacle here. And Peter, Peter can't handle it. He, he can't accept the way that Jesus' victory comes in exactly the opposite way that all of us expect that it would happen. And this story, it like, it gets crazy. It's out of control. And we feel a loss of power and an uncertainty. It's a bit like it's a bit like in the earthquake, in an earthquake. People say in an earthquake, you kind of you go to the ground for protection, for cover, but in an earthquake, the ground itself is where the danger is coming from. And he doesn't know where to stand. And then Jesus goes and makes it worse. He says, Oh, not only that, Peter. You need to follow the same path too. I'm asking you to embrace this story, to follow this path. This is the life. This is what it means to me. The way of Jesus is to lay yourself down, to deny yourself. It is to give yourself way, it, away. It's even to die to yourself. And it's hard to understand of all what that means, but it sounds like a real loss of power. I mean, willingly making the choice to give up my authority, my ability to control my own life. That was Jesus, what Jesus was doing, and that's what Paul was preaching. And as people began to understand it, they resisted. And that's why people rioted against this message. We're asked to give it up, to let it go, to give it away. How, how is this any sort of way of achieving your goals? It's, it's totally counterintuitive. I mean, it's like, it's like turning the world upside down. No control. Let's riot. And that's kind of how people are feeling with you. We're inclined to push back the same way that Peter did because we don't get it any more than he did. We like people with power. We like to have a leader, a king, to be our savior, our hero. So what if you're expecting a Messiah to be that superhero, that chosen one who's sent from God to fix everything that's messed up? Doesn't it seem as if that's what it will take to overcome the dark and overwhelming power of the empire? Yeah, in Jesus' day, they didn't need Star Wars. They had a real evil empire to deal with. And then maybe there will be some way to alleviate the poverty that constantly threatens your family. We, what's going to happen? We need some divine intervention. Someone with powers beyond the ordinary, a, a superhero, a god. And today, it's not that different. I mean, people kind of feel a 
wishful thinking when they watch some of those movies. You want to pin your hopes on someone like a Superman or a Captain America, a Batman, an Iron Man, or Spider-Man. I mean, why are superhero stories so popular now? It's because they speak to our deepest fears. When we're afraid of losing control, we look to these people who, you know what, they're never out of control. And we see power and wealth, celebrity and technology. I mean, because superheroes, they're not counterculture, they're superculture. If you will look, the top 10 grossing movies of all time, half of them feature superheroes. Avengers, The Dark Knight, Batman, Spider-Man. We want heroes. So, Donald Trump got that when he ran for president. Right? He cast himself as the only one. I'm the only one who can do it. You need a hero, and I'm it. That sounds very much like what he's been doing on the campaign trail. Yeah, he's, he's responding. He's really shrewd in responding. He knows the heart of most of us. And he knows that, that we're struggling with that. There's a guy um, named Grant Morrison. If you are a comic book nerd, you might know his name because he is one of the premier writers of comic books in our day. He also wrote a book about comic book heroes called Super Gods. And listen to this one quote from it because there are, there are, um, there's something, just his, his take on our society. We live in the stories we tell ourselves and in a secular, scientific, rational culture that lacks any convincing spiritual leadership. Superhero stories speak loudly and boldly to our deepest fears, our deepest longings, longings, our aspirations. They're not afraid to be hopeful, not embarrassed to be optimistic and utterly fearless in the dark. They're about as far from social realism as you can get. But the best superhero stories deal directly with the mythic elements of human experience that we can all relate to in ways that are imaginative, profound, funny, and provocative. They exist to solve problems of all kinds and can always be counted on to find a way to save the day. His assessment of our world and our culture and actually our spirituality is kind of challenging. Are comic book heroes really our new gods? But then we encounter Jesus' message, the message that was at the heart of Paul's teaching. We're told that suffering and dying is what it takes for us to be brought back to restoration, wholeness, and completeness. Jesus took a cross and then tells us that we need to take up a cross as well. And it's the opposite of what we expect. Our her whole world seems to shift on its axis. And so when the rioting mob brought the missionaries to the authorities, they called them troublemakers. But you know, the more literal translation of what they said is, is these are the men who have been flipping the world upside down. And the thing is, they are right. That is exactly what Paul and his team were trying to do, to get people to see that the culture of power and violence, the culture of seeking to control others and circumstances as well was just not enough. Paul, Paul, in fact, says, yeah, we're trying to flip the world, but it's not. We're trying to flip it upside down. It's already upside down. We're trying to flip it back right side up. The upside-down world is evident all around us. It was then, it is today. Paul and his allies are simply trying to be an extension of the mission of Jesus, which is to try to flip it around again, right side up. And that's the story that's going to play out through the rest of the book of Acts. It's a witness. This whole book is a witness to a world that was then and is now upside down. In Minneapolis, people reacted to a world in which they felt without power, in which they felt they didn't have a real part. And actually, in some ways, they saw a reality that, that exists. They saw the world for what it was. People who were, people who were desperate for help 
we are a hero or a hero. But Jesus is an image for that. Not the suffering Jesus. But it is only in his humility, his grace, and his sacrifice that the world actually flips back right side up. To follow Jesus means to see the world is upside down and to join him in flipping it back right side up. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that our eyes will be open to that and that the choices that we make, the words we say, our actions, who we are, become part of your work of turning the world back right side up. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Norma. That's what you need when the world's upside down and you feel like rioting and request to fill our hearts with your peace. Uh, we're going to take a few moments for prayer. And as we pray, you're invited to lift up the names of those who are in your heart that particularly need prayer. Uh, prayers of request, of need, prayers for people who are hurting. But also, we invite you to share prayers of celebration and thanksgiving. Um, perhaps you have seen an answer to prayer. And um, if you're online, you're not going to hear it. So I'm going to try to repeat what people in the group say out loud as we pray. Um, and I'm going to invite them just to speak out loud right within the prayer. And so your words will be the prayer. I'll repeat them. It, God doesn't need to hear it twice in order to hear it, to know our prayers. But, uh, but the people online might. So let us, let us join together in a time with God, a time of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that we can, that we can, we give you thanks that we can pray. We can talk to you anytime, any place. And nothing's going to keep us from being able to do that. You've promised that. But we also thank you that you give us the opportunity to gather together and, and to share our hearts, to open our hearts, to join them together as we talk to you. And so we're taking advantage of that this morning. We do bless you, Lord. And we give you thanks for your grace to us. And I'm going to say, Lord, in your love, and all of you respond, Hear this, our prayer. What other prayer do we want to share? Thankful for the prayers of all these people and for healing. 
So Norma, thankful for the prayers of all the people and for healing. She's better because she's here. So. <laughs> Lord, in your love. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, Yeah. What's your uncle's name? Ryan. Okay. And his uncle Ryan was in a car accident that caused hospitalization. Lungs filled and ribs broken, but he is going to recover. And so thanks to God that Ryan is still with us. Lord, in your love. She also added a prayer of thanksgiving that she is surrounded by a loving church family. And I think we all echo that. Lord, in your love. So, Fern first. Okay, prayers for Joanne Kuntz, who's in hospice now. Prayers for comfort and for peace with her. Lord, in your love. And you. Prayers for my son in law who's had some procedures in the back and they're waiting for results. Um, uh huh. Um, what's his name again? Aaron. Aaron. So, um, prayers for Anne's son in law, Aaron, for some tests that he's had that there will be positive results. Lord, in your love. Sarah. Oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, prayers for my successful procedure. I wasn't here last week, and it wasn't because I was in the hospital or anything like that. There was a pulpit exchange, and I was here, and was, I, was, I was preaching in his church, his churches. On Monday, on Monday, I had a procedure that I had made because it was a patient one, but it was actually a heart procedure. And I'm feeling great. And so um, Sarah's prayers are for our thanksgiving. Thanks to God's healing touch, even in my life. And I'll echo that. Lord, in your love. Yes. system pulls together and you know, keeps, on, keeps on going, but we also find the right uh, solutions. For, for everything, yeah. So Donna is asking for prayers for, for Louise, for her mom, Louise, who isn't with us this morning. She's at home. But for additional health issues and, and um, that, we, that we come up with dealing with.
celebration of 19 chickens in the freezer at Donna's farm. I'm not sure the chickens would feel the same way. Um, but um, yes, there are prayers of joy and celebration. Oh, oh and Cheryl has one. Oh, okay, yes. Um, yeah, so celebration for, for Donna's chickens, Lord in your love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, also uh, uh, Cheryl lifted up John White, who's not with us this morning, and John hates to miss church, but he's over at Osceola Medical Center. He is hoping to be able to come home this week. He's been having a few issues, so let's just keep, let, if John can't be right in our presence, let's keep him in our prayers. Lord, in your love. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yay, a celebration for Uncle Kurt's hip surgery uh, yeah, a couple weeks ago, and that has succeeded. So, yes, Lord, in your love. Okay. We are all thankful, God's that <laughs> we're thankful Bob's with us. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of nights ago, uh, some of our friends, Linda Owasco, who's often done music for our services, and Bob were at a rehearsal at the art barn, and the storm took a tree down that found both of their cars. And um, Bob's is still sitting out there because it ain't moving. Uh, Linda was able to get hers driven away, but the real blessing is that they were safe inside the barn, and Bob was even able to save a guitar that was in his car. So, <laughs> so yes, thanksgiving for that. Lord, in your love. So we're we're rechristening Bob with the word, with the name Job this uh, year. <laughs> So, <laughs> but um, it is a blessing. It's a blessing to have him with us this morning, too. Uh, Lord, there is joy in being able to talk with you and being able to share that conversation with just a group of dear friends. We, we love that we can be part of this, this family of love and welcome and fellowship. And we pray that your grace will be on us so that whatever we say, whatever we do, that our very lives will be testimony to who you are. We pray all of this in Jesus' name as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You, you know, sometimes those, those sorts of prayers where I just say, you know, speak out your, your prayer request as a prayer in itself, and you go, well, that's sort of a weird prayer because Jack keeps interrupting it with little announcement bits and things like that. But, you know, there's something about our prayers that are kind of just like a conversation that we're having together. And we're having it with God, too. And I love those kinds of prayers. And maybe when we think of prayer in that way, it becomes less daunting. It becomes more of a natural part of our lives because, you know, we live our lives in the presence of God. Let's join in singing, We Are Called.
are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called, we are called to serve one another. To walk humbly with God. Amen. I love that song, even though I never quite play it right. Um, but, um, hey, as we close our service, there are a couple of things, uh, a couple of announcements we just want to share. Most of the stuff you can see in the bulletin, things that are going on this week, things that are coming up. A couple things I do want to mention. Um, we're out in the yard here partly because there have been a few yard workers who have poured out a lot of time and energy um, making our yard so beautiful, the flowers that um, our gardens wear are that are weedless, and um, and that doesn't happen just by itself. There are people who've spent a lot of times on hands and knees getting those weeds out. Um, we're here on the patio, and I just invite all of you as you leave here today to look at the edge of the patio. It's really neatly trimmed, so. <laughs> um, so it's thank you to our, our yard workers who do such great work. At, at, this is the face our, our, um, our church presents to the community. Yes, thank you, folks. Yeah, somebody was clapping, so we give you applause. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I've got another thank you that actually came from a letter that we received. Dear Osceola United Methodist Church and also to Fern. <laughs> Thank you for inviting our good neighbor ukulele group to play and sing at your dinner and pie social last evening. We all enjoyed being there, spreading the joy of the music and fellowship with you all. Thank you also for the monetary donation to our group. We will be printing our second songbook, Uke Can Do It Too. <laughs> With over 100 new songs to sing and play, your gift will go towards that and spreading even more ukulele joy and fellowship in our community. God bless and thanks again from Jane and the Good Neighbors Uke Group. I think there are a couple in our church that actually joined the group after they played here. So we have, um, yeah, oh, Lorelai, yep. Yeah, so she's now, a, yeah, so she's now a ukulele nerd. And, um, and it was such delight. I mean, we were give it one. We were give, give them thanks because it was such a joyful addition to our pie social. And we'll have them back here. So, um, so thank you to them. Uh, just a few of the thanks that we we are blessed. By. I, are there some other things that I need to make mention of here? Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl. Farmer's Market, we need more baked goods and help. I might not, not the whole time, I think. If you, the servants picnic is in 16 days, so you can sign up to help with that. So, um, Cheryl was bringing up the farmer's market. If you have not been here on a Friday afternoon, um, hope you can come and visit us uh, because, well, this Friday we had the biggest one ever. I think we had 14 vendors in our parking lot. I mean, a full farmer's market. Some of them have their own following, and so customers come with them, and all of the rest of us benefit from that. We've got tables out. It, it actually is a little bit of a mini county fair, and, uh, and it's just a real joyful time. Uh, this Friday, we had it rained again during the fair on Friday, but people kept on selling and people kept on enjoying it. Um, we had music. 
Bob had a tree fall on his car, and John and Wasco had a tree fall on his car, and both of them were here to play music the day after. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was just, um, yeah, come and see the fellowship and the joy and the light we have at that market. And there were some things that didn't sell at the market, believe it or not. And we've got them right over here by the side of the church. And leave an offering when you come and take it. So, uh, <laughs> at any rate, so those are all the th those are all the things. In, in a table out there. <laughs> so while we're talking about fairs, the Osceola Fair is not all that far away, and we have a potato booth there. And so sign-up sheets are going to be coming out pretty soon. And so uh, we'll uh, be ready for that. So a fun fair. Oh, that's right. You guys have that too. See? It's the season. So, hey, let's, let's stand for the benediction. Because I'm... Noticing that it's sprinkling a little bit right now, right? So let's pray a benediction. Redeeming and reconciling God, let your dream of a world that includes all people in your family be our dream as well. Fill us with your spirit to make that happen. Empower us and give us a passion to love your neighbors and to grow to the fullness in Christ. Amen. Let's sing, let there be peace on earth as we close. of the resurrected Christ, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you this week, folks. Hey, there's a, a, a blessing box, our offering box over by the table there. If you uh, want to leave an offering, you can stop in and do that. Be sure to look at our table of abundance. And uh, there is a fellowship time. And uh, maybe you could put chairs away. And maybe you could head inside and grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you, folks.